John chapter 1, begin reading in verse 14. If you're able to stand, would you stand with me? If not, you may remain seated as I read John chapter 1, verses 14 down to verse 18. The Bible says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of Him, and cried, saying, This was He of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for He was before me. And of His fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Amen. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. Let's stop there and pray. Our Father, we thank You for Your goodness. It's been a joy to be in Your house today. Thank You for the great music, the great fellowship, the great congregational singing. And Father, as we come now to this point of the service where we have the preaching of your word, Lord, I pray that you'd remove any distractions from our minds today and from this room. I do pray if there's someone here today that is not certain that they're on their way to heaven, that today would be the day that they get saved. And Father, for the believer, that you would challenge us by this one simple truth we're going to look at today. I ask you, please, to enable me to preach thy word for a fresh filling of thy spirit. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. D.L. Moody is considered by many to be one of the greatest evangelists of all time. Moody went to heaven at the end of the 1800s. He, during his lifetime, he traveled more than, they say, one million miles. Understand, this was before modern transportation. He spoke to more than 100 million people, and he dealt personally with nearly 50,000 individuals. His ministry spanned two continents. While Moody was in London, he met a young medical student by the name of Wilfred Grenfell. Moody did what he did with all people he met. He spoke to Wilfred about his soul, confronted him with the gospel, and D.L. Moody led Wilfred Grenfell to the Lord Jesus Christ. Grenfell got saved. The two had parted for some time. Of course, their meeting ended, and he didn't see him for a while. And Grenfell went on to complete his education, and he began working in Canada. Now, 14 years later, now Dr. Grenfell was in the United States, and he decided to go ahead and look up Dr. Moody, or D.L. Moody. And he found him, and they decided to meet with one another, and they did. They met in Boston, and they began to speak and greet, with, greet one another and speak. And Dr. Grenfell uh, said this to D.L. Moody. He said, quote, I want to thank you for leading me to Christ. And uh, Moody said this. He said, that was 14 years ago. He said, can I ask you something? And the Grenfell said, uh, uh, why, certainly. He looked him in the eye and he said, what have you been doing since? And Grenfell stopped for a moment and he said, well, I've been serving the Lord so that others may come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as well. And Grenfell went on to tell him what happened after he got saved. He told him that he graduated from medical school and he would begin what would later become a 40-year ministry as a medical missionary in Canada. Uh, he was both an evangelist leading people to the Lord and a skilled physician, and he ministered by the end of his ministry to literally thousands of Eskimos and thousands of Canadians in Labrador. He started five hospitals, he started seven nursing clinics, he started three orphanages, and he ministered to the people's physical needs and did not stop there to their spiritual needs as well. Grenfell saw many, many people saved. Well, the conversation continued and Moody asked Dr. Grenfell this. He said, do, do you regret making that decision? And Dr. Grenfell quickly replied, no. And he went on to say, the only regret is for the person who has come to know Christ as their Savior, who when asked, what have you been doing since, has to hang their head in shame. What a powerful thought. What a powerful story. What have you been doing since? What have I been doing since? 
You know, for the past several weeks, we've been looking at this first chapter of the Gospel of John, and the express purpose of the Gospel of John is stated for us in John chapter 20 and verse 31. The very reason that this book was penned is this, quote, but these are written that she might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Now, for the first 18 verses of chapter 1, the Apostle John has been giving what is known as the prologue or the introductory section of the book, uh, kind of his introducing of his subject. And in this prologue, it's quite interesting that John comes right out of the gate declaring who Jesus Christ is and what Jesus Christ did and why he came. For example, in verses 1 through 5, he tells us simply that Jesus Christ is very God. He is the Jehovah of the Old Testament. He is the creator of the universe. We read in John chapter 1 and verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. John quickly and boldly declares that Jesus Christ is a co-equal with God, he is co-existent with God, and he is eternally existent with God as well. And then in verses 10 through 12, he tells us how Christ made the world and came into the very world that he made, but the world knew him not. In other words, how he came into this world uh, there in Bethlehem and started his ministry uh, about the age of 33. He came to the Jews and he presented himself to them as their Messiah and they received him not. They rejected him. But then he goes on to say that powerful verse in verse 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name. And then in verse 14, John tells us how Jesus Christ, the Word, became flesh. By the way, that's what we're celebrating tomorrow. Amen. Christmas, God in the flesh. And he states in verse 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. But notice when we get to verse 15, the Apostle John is now going to mention once again a man by the name of John. He's talking about here John the Baptist. Now this was not the first time that John the Baptist has been mentioned uh, in this uh, prologue. If you look back to verse 6, we read a few verses about him. The Bible says there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. Now, John will become, in verse 19 through 34, kind of the centerpiece of the narrative, if you will, and we'll say much more about him later. But I do want to hone in this morning on verse 15, where the Apostle John makes a statement about John the Baptist that I would like to preach on this morning. I want you to notice the simple four or five word phrase there in verse 15. John bear witness of him. This morning I'd like to preach on that very subject, bearing witness of him. Think of it. Watch the progression. Don't miss it. Jesus came. Uh, John was sent to be a witness. And what did he do? He bore witness. He did the very thing that God had brought him here to do. You know, if you're here today and you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, if you're here today and you could say, yes, I've been born again, I've been regenerated, I've been redeemed, I'm trusting in Christ and Christ alone for my soul's salvation, then there is a critical, a life-changing, a priority determining truth that every believer must understand. You say, preacher, what is it? Well, it's this. 
The primary reason that God has saved us and left us here on this earth is to bear witness of Him. Amen. To bear witness of Him. Amen. That's why we're here. Amen. That's why He's left us here. Amen. Do you remember when the Lord Jesus Christ left this earth? Just before He left, He commanded His disciples, and I emphasize the word commanded. It was not a suggestion. It was not a recommendation. Not to some of them, not to just a select few, but to all of them to be witnesses unto Him. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and under the uttermost part of the earth. Luke chapter 24 and verse 47 puts it this way. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Watch this. And ye are witnesses of these things. Perhaps the most in-depth description of our assignment is found in what we refer to as the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19 and 20 where the Lord said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. You see, that means something very important. That every believer, every one of us, is to confront people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are to lead them to a saving knowledge of the Lord. And those that have believed, we're to lead them to follow the Lord in obedience to scriptural baptism, a local church ordinance. And then we're to teach those believers to be a follower or disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to do what John did, bear witness of him Amen. to a lost Amen. and dying world. Amen. Think about it. The same one in verse 7, notice the same came for a witness in verse 15, bear witness of him. He did what he was put here to do. Amen. The question is, are we? <coughs> You see, Christmas, we think about it, we think about this day, and we know, we acknowledge, He came, He came, He came, and He did. The Savior of the world came. But the question is, are we bearing witness of Him? This morning, I'd like for us just to kind of sit on verse 15 for a little bit and consider John's witness of Christ and use Him as an example of what you and I ought to be doing. Notice, first of all, number one, let's consider the expression of John. Notice what he did. John bare witness of him and cried. Now, what does it, does it mean to bear witness? Well, anyone who understands the law understands what it means to be a witness. It means to speak what you know to be true. It, it means to testify. It, it means to attest. Now, for the Christian, it means this. To be a witness of Christ, it means to tell what we are convinced is true. And we are convinced either by experience or by divine revelation. And this is what John did. John bare witness. He told others what he was convinced was true. Now, I'd like for us to notice two things about how John bore witness. Number one is this. His witness was a public witness. You know, when the Old Testament prophets foretold of John the Baptist, think of how he was described. We read in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3, he describes John the Baptist as the voice of him that crieth, notice, in the, in the wilderness. As we look back at the, at the history of God's prophets, we find that God's faithful servants have always bore witness of God publicly. Amen. It was never only privately, although sometimes it was both. It was always publicly. Amen. 
The prophet Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 17, 19, the Bible says, Thus saith the Lord unto me, God commanding Jeremiah, Go and stand in the gate of the children of the people, whereby the kings of Judah come in, and by the which they go out, and in all the gates of Jerusalem, and say unto them, Hear ye the word of the Lord. That's what he was commanded to do. God tells the prophet Jeremiah just on the eve of the captivity of the southern kingdom of Judah not to stay in his room, uh, uh, not to stay uh, uh, in the temple, but to go to the gates, go to the cities, go out and proclaim publicly the word of God. He was bearing witness Amen. publicly. When Jesus Christ sent out his disciples, we read in Luke chapter 10 and verse 1, After these things the Lord appointed other seventy also, watch this, and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place whether he himself would come. He took those disciples and commanded them to go out to this place and that place, to this city and, and that city. What were they to do? They were to bear witness publicly of the Lord Jesus Christ. We even read the New Testament church doing the same. The pattern's the same throughout the Bible. We read the Apostle Paul as he's speaking to those pastors from Ephesus in Acts chapter 20 and verse 20. He said, And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. When that early church heard the message of the Lord Jesus Christ and they knew that Christ commanded them to be a witness, what did they do? They took it out in the streets. They took it out in the highways and hedges. They, they took it out to both publicly and from house to house. You see, it is not enough to speak of Christ amongst ourselves. We have to get it out into the world. We have to tell those that do not know the gospel must be taken beyond the four walls of this church. Amen. We must take it into the marketplace. We must take it into the highways and hedges, into the hearts of the people that we pass every day. The people that we come into contact with every day. Those that we work with, those that we say that we love. Uh, we must get the seed out of the barn. Amen. Amen. There's plenty of seed in the barn. And by the way, uh, an indicting, self-indicting statement is this. It's easy to say what I say in this forum. Amen. But I'm not to leave it here. I need to take it out into a lost and dying world. We are all to publicly bear witness. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 20, the Bible says, Wisdom crieth without. Notice she uttereth her voice in the streets. So John's witness was public, but it was also this. It was also passionate. Notice how he did it. The Bible says, John bear witness of him and cried. Uh, he cried. That has the idea of perhaps weeping or perhaps just crying out, lifting up his voice and sounding forth the truth of who Jesus Christ is. You see, John's, uh, John's witness was no, not a mere statement of facts. He was not merely an academic exercise. He wasn't just going through the motions. Uh, he wasn't just putting in some time. His witness, no doubt, was passionate. His witness was heartfelt. His witness was fervent. Uh, John the Baptist had a burden. Praise the Lord. My question is, do we? You see, he had a burden to be uh, obedient to his Lord. Uh, he had a burden to, to do exactly what God placed him on this earth to do. And, and this is what our desire ought to be. Amen. Do you know our witnessing really ought to be rooted more in our love for the Lord than our love for the lost? Some people say, well, love the lost, love the lost, and we should love the lost. But I'll tell you what, go out and start witnessing to people, and I'll tell you what, some of the responses that you get makes it kind of hard to do that at times. And if I'm doing that because I love the lost, I, let me say this, there is a greater motive than that. Amen. We ought to love the lost, no doubt. And if not, then something is indeed wrong with my heart. But there's a purpose much greater than that, and that is this, our love for the Lord. Amen. 
Amen. We go for him. That's why we go. We do it because he's commanded us uh, to do it. And we ought to have a burden to obey our God. Amen. Jesus Christ said in John 14, 15, If ye love me, keep my commandments. That's a pretty challenging statement, is it not? Amen. That means if I don't keep his commandments, well, you make the inference there. But we see the expression of John. It was a public expression. It was a passionate expression. But notice, secondly, the intention of John. The expression of John and the intention of John. What, what was John's intention? Well, it's very, very simple. We read, John bear witness of him and cried, saying, notice, this was he of whom I spake. You see, John's intention was, I believe, one thing and one thing only. And that was to point others to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In other words, it was not so that he could get a following. He wasn't trying to get a following. He wasn't trying to get a pat on the back. He wasn't trying to bring glory to himself. Uh, he wasn't trying to win others to himself. John was not looking to make a name for himself. His intention was simple, to point others to the Lord Jesus Christ. We won't go there for time's sake, but if you were to later turn to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5 and verse 18, it really sums up uh, in many ways what you and I have been left here to do. We read, and all things are of God. Notice, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Notice, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That word reconciliation has the idea of taking two parties that are at odds with one another and taking one and bringing them to the other and joining them together. That's the ministry of reconciliation. Here we have fallen man at enmity with God, an enemy of God, unreconciled, apart, separated from God. And here is the Lord Jesus Christ that says, Come unto me, all ye that labor, that he would give us rest. And our ministry is to reconcile man to God. Not to make a name for ourselves. Uh, not to, if you will, build a church. Uh, uh, not to give glory to us. Uh, but to point people to him. Amen. That should be our intention. May I say a couple statements that may shock some of us based on the culture that we live in. One is this. Nowhere in the Bible are we commanded to invite people to church. That's true. Now, it's good to do that. I do it, and I'm going to continue to do it. We should do that. Please don't stop. I'm not saying don't do that. What I'm saying is that's not what we're commanded to do. Uh, we should invite people. I do it all the time. And by God's grace, I'm going to continue to do that. But God doesn't say, go ye into all the world and invite people to church. Here's another statement. Nowhere in the Bible are we commanded to build a church. We're not commanded to build a church. You know, there has been a great movement in our nation of churches whose primary goal is to see how many people they can gather together in a, in a building. That's their goal. That's even how they gauge their success. They have the idea, the bigger the work, the more successful they are. That's a grave mistake. Amen. That is a man-centered philosophy. Right. The measure of a church's success is not its size. The measure of a church's success is in its likeness to Christ and in its obedience to Christ. Amen. Amen. You want to see how good a church is? See how well they conform to this book. Amen. That's what a good church is. Amen. Not the size of it uh, at all. And many of these churches, uh, or some may I say so-called churches, will use all kinds of means uh, to accomplish this goal. May I remind us, we are not the church builders. Jesus Christ is the church builder. Amen. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 16, if you would, please. Matthew chapter 16. Very familiar verse. Look at verse 18. I'm just going to jump into the middle of it for time's sake. 
But Jesus Christ is confronting his disciples and saying in, in the coast of Caesarea Philippi, who, whom the men say, I the Son of God am. And some say he's Elias, some say he's John the Baptist. And he asks Peter, who do, who do you say I am? And he says in verse 16, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Look at verse 18. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, the, the rock is Christ, by the way. Amen. Upon this rock, the fact that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Notice he says, I will build my church. Amen. Notice what he did not say. He didn't say, you will build my church. He didn't say, you will build your church. He didn't say, even say, I will build your church. Right. He said, I will build my church. Here's the principle. We do the witnessing. He does the building. Amen. You see, our responsibility is one thing and one thing alone uh, is to point the people to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're to do. So that thought begs the question, why is it that so many churches are filled with people that many even claim to be Christians, yet so few people are pointing people to Christ. Why is that? Even in good churches, there's so few. Why? If that's what we're here for, uh, if we're to follow the model of John, uh, uh, who Christ came uh, and John was sent to bear witness, and John did indeed do that, why aren't we? Well, I think there's at least three reasons. The first one is this, and by the way, God forbid this is the case, but it is possible. Number one is false professions. False professions. You say, what do you mean by that? People that don't know the Lord can't tell people about the Lord. Amen. That's right. If they don't know how to be saved, how are they going to witness to people how to be saved? You know, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 19 reads this. Uh, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Amen. That seems to indicate that even in a church meeting, there's some people that aren't saved. Uh, that act like they're saved, or talk like they're saved, but they're not saved at all. If you have never been born again, never regenerated, you can't be a witness. Amen. So maybe that's one of the reasons. There's another reason. Perhaps you say, well, preacher, I, I am saved. Praise the Lord, you are. Well, how about this? Number two is this, familiarity with the message. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, perhaps we've become so familiar with the gospel message that it's lost its freshness. It's not exciting anymore. I, I mean, we, 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 it's not new. I mean, we, it's a message that you, you and I in a church like this, we hear week after week uh, uh, in Sunday school, month after month, uh, from the pulpit and from our chapels. We hear it uh, over and over again. Uh, perhaps we've even told it so many times that it's become mundane. Routine. Or unexciting. And perhaps the witnessing that we used to do when we first got saved because we were so excited about what the Lord has done in our life, we're not doing it anymore because it's, you know, we've heard it again and again and again and again. Maybe that's a reason. It may be false professions. It may be familiarity with the message. But there's a third one. And I would, I, 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 I would say, or at least propose, that this is probably the greatest one. You say, what's that? Fear of man. The fear of man. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25 says this, The fear of man bringeth a snare. We fear what people think of us. Right. We, we, we fear what they might say about us. We fear what they might do to us. 
After all, if I talk to them about the Lord, they might, you know, say, oh, you're one of those. Oh, you're one of those holy rollers, huh? Oh, you're one of those drink the purple juicers, huh? You're one of those. Oh, you're one of those that needs religion as a crutch, huh? Uh, you're, you're, you're one of the, and we fear that. Because we, we fear what they think. We fear. We don't want to look different. Uh, our flesh wants to fit in. Uh, it wants to be accepted and all of that. Do you know that the Lord Jesus Christ warned us of this? Right. He told his disciples in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. We understand what he's talking about. He's saying, don't fear man. All they can do is destroy the body. Fear God. It can do much more than that. Amen. And then while all of us have to deal with the fear of man, it's in all of us, there ought to be a fear that's greater than that that makes that fear of man go away. Amen. And that's the fear of God. Amen. You see, the greater fear makes all lesser fears go away. Amen. It's when we fear God more than anything that it doesn't matter what they think. It doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't even matter what they do to us. Because we know that our God in heaven has commanded us to bear witness of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to a lost and dying world. Amen. You see, a wise servant will not let the fear of man stop him Amen. from pointing people to Christ. Amen. Because that's why we're here. That's why we're here. Amen. So we see the expression of John. We see the intention of John. And then thirdly, and back in John chapter 1, we see the description of Christ. We see something that John says here. Uh, again, John bare witness of him and cried, uh, saying, This was he of whom I spake. Notice how he describes him. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, Amen. for he was before me. Now, what John is saying here, we understand, it's not the extent of his message. And he said over, and uh, we'll see this a little bit later, Lord willing, in verse 29, he says, Behold, as he saw Jesus Christ coming along that hillside on that day, he pointed up and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Amen. He, he, he cried out uh, a little bit later, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Amen. So he said much more than what he's saying here, but notice what he did say here. He describes two things about the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, he describes his superiority. He that cometh after me is preferred before me. That phrase, preferred before me, that's an interesting phrase. A lot of commentaries, all that. Here's what it means in a nutshell. It means more excellent than me. Amen. He that is coming after me, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, compared to me, I'm nothing. He's everything. He is preferred. He is more excellent. Uh, uh, he is not, as some would say, uh, just some religious person. He's not going to be just some good man and not even just a good example. The one that's coming after me is the Savior of the world. Amen. He's preferred before me. You see, Jesus Christ is the only one who can solve man's sin problem. Amen. That's why God came to this earth to go to the cross of Calvary, to shed his blood for our sin, uh, to pay man's sin debt in full, that if anyone will repent of their sin and trust Jesus Christ as their Savior, all of their sins, past, present, and future, are washed away under the blood of Jesus Christ. Romans 8.3 puts it this way, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned to sin in the flesh. The law was never designed to save us. We'll talk about that, Lord willing, next week. It was designed really to condemn us, to show us our guilt, and to do, uh, and only Jesus Christ could do what the law could not do, and that is save us. So we see his superiority, but then lastly, we see also his eternality. His eternality. You say, what do you mean by that? He's eternal. He says an interesting thing. For he was before me. 
Now, if you understand the chronology of John the Baptist and the Lord Jesus Christ, and of course, one being merely a man, one being God in the flesh, but you'll understand that the birth of those two were at two different times. John was born into this world six months before the Savior. He was here first. Yet he says, earthly speaking, for he was before me. Now, anyone uh, humanly that say, what do you mean? You were before him. Uh-uh. We're talking about God here. Amen. He's speaking of his eternality, his eternal existence. He's bearing witness of the deity of Jesus Christ. The bearing witness. The one that you and I are to bear witness of is the one, only one, that can reconcile man to God. He is the only one that can grant forgiveness of sins. He is the only one that can get people to heaven. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Amen. All religions are not the same. The message of Jesus Christ is unique. It is different from all of them. There's this understanding that people have in our culture, a wrong one, that we're all, it's all the same. Everybody's just telling everybody, just be a good person and we'll all go to heaven. That's not the Bible. Every religion outside of biblical Christianity says that in order to get to heaven, you have to do this or do this or do this, depending on what their religion is. But the Bible is unique. It says all of us are sinners, and none of us can get to heaven by anything we do. That's why we need a Savior. That's why we need Jesus Christ to save us. And when we put our trust not in ourselves, not in our religion, not in what we do, but fully in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ for our soul's salvation, that is when a person gets born again. And by the way, it's the same, it's the same message for all of humanity. It's not many roads lead to heaven like they say many roads lead to Rome. There's only one way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Do you know him today as your Savior? I want to challenge us this morning as I conclude here with the same question that D.L. Moody challenged Dr. Wilfred Grenfell with. If you're saved here today, what have you been doing since? What? Have you been bearing witness of him? That's what we're supposed to be doing. What good is his coming if nobody knows why? Yesterday we went to house after house. We drove by house after house of people that had Christmas decorations, manger scenes, all kinds of different things. And, and, and for the ones we knocked on the door uh, of, many of them, uh, they would have the decorations. If you would say, do you celebrate Christmas? They'd say, yes. Do you believe Jesus was born? They'd say, yes. If you say, what was Christmas about? They'd say, well, we do shop in this and that, but it's really, it's about the birth of Christ. But then you ask this question, why did he come? And in almost, almost every single case, the answer would be, basically, I don't know. I don't know. Why don't they know? Maybe it's because we're not bearing witness of him. Again, what good is his coming if nobody knows why? Let's pray together.